<clears throat> Hello and good evening. Hope you're all doing well. I am just starting this stream series up today, this little podcast, um, actually more so to help me study for an exam I have coming up in about a month's time. It is a remedial sports massage uh, course exam, it's about a three hour exam. So I'm just using the reading repetition uh, benefit for myself. So anyone that jumps in, um, just sit back and chill. It's just going to be me talking through some anatomy, physiology, and pathology. Number one, that's what we started at the start of our course. So we're just revisiting some old haunts to get an idea of how things were and how things are, and ideally get um, get everything back into into position really how things are and ideally get um get everything back into, mm. into position just turn that down how things bit. are and ideally get um get everything back into, mm. into just position turn that down how things bit. are and i oh yeah just turn that off again um just going to turn my sensitivity down because i think it was quite high up so i'm just going to turn that down to zero <clears throat> so that should be good uh, so yeah, anyone that jumps on here, uh, apologies in advance if this isn't your cup of tea. Um, just do this more, more so for my own benefit than anyone else's. So yeah, enjoy. So first off is anatomical orientation. One, anatomical direction. Um, so with figure one, we're looking at the anterior, so the front of the body, uh, which, which means, yeah, uh, anterior means in front of, towards, or at the front of the body, so it's whatever's anterior. Posterior, opposite of that. So we're looking at figure figure two, which is the back of the body, so it's behind, towards, or at the back side of the body, meaning all those. Um, so we have a couple other things as well, which is superior, so as we look at the figure, the closer towards the head, the more superior it is, the lower down towards the feet, the more inferior it is. Um, also, for a superior, there's above towards the head or upper part of the structure of the body. For inferior, we've got below, away from the head, or towards the lower part of the structure of the body as well. So, another point for figure 1.5 is medial, uh, from medius in Latin, meaning middle toward or at the midline of the body, or on the interior inner side of the limb. We've got lateral, uh, from lattice in Latin means side, away from the midline of the body, or outer side towards the mid or the limb. So we're working towards, so midline, we've got the center here, lateral, we're working away from that midline. So something here is lateral, to something here, something here is lateral, to, this is mid, closer to the midline, further away from midline, more lateral, less lateral, more medial, um, less medial sort of, sort, of, sort of idea. Proximal is an interesting one, proximal and distal, don't know why I keep rolling up my uh, dressing gown, as you do. Uh, so figure 1.7 for proximal from proximus in Latin, meaning next to, Closer to the centre of the body, the navel, or to the point of attachment of a limb uh, to the body torso. So closer towards that, so proximal. Proximal to the elbow, so it's going to be that side of the elbow. Distal to the elbow, that side of the elbow and further down. Uh, so distal from distanus in Latin, meaning distant. Further from the centre of the body or from the point of attachment of a limb to the torso. Okay, points we have as well. <clears throat> uh, we have superficial towards what the body's surface, deep farther away from the body of the surface, uh, surface more internal. We have figure 111, dorsum, uh, the posterior surface of something, e.g. the back of the hand or the top of the foot. We have palmar, which is the anterior surface of the hand, i.e. the palm. Plantar is the sole of the foot, so plantar flexor is going to be the is the planting flexor of the foot. Palma, top of the hand, dorsum, back of the hand. So yeah, all pretty interesting stuff. So a couple of planes of the body. We have a frontal, which is corona, so it basically diverts the body in half from there all the way down. 
We have sagittal, which takes us from the middle part, uh, so the medium, and then you've got transverse, which cuts us in from that halfway point. Which is, yeah. Okay. Next, structure and function of the musculoskeletal system. One, connective tissue overview. Groups of cells that have a similar structure and function are called tissues. There are four primary types of tissue, each with a set of characteristic functions. One is epithelial, for example, the skin whose function is to cover and protect the body. Two, connective, for example, ligaments, tendons, fascia, cartilage and bone, whose function is to protect, support and bind together different parts of the body. Uh, three is muscle. The main function of muscle is to enable movement of the body. And finally, number four, nervous. Nerves, sent, um, nerves control body functions and movement. In musculoskeletal anatomy, the, the type of connective tissue that concerns us are the most connective tissues in muscle. Composition. All connective tissues are made up of, a di of different types of cells and varying amounts of non-living substances and surrounding the cells. That surrounds the cells. Example A we have is extracellular matrix, collagen and elastin fibers providing overall structure, water and pro uh, proto protoglycans, also known as ground substance, providing lubrication and spacing between the collagen fibers. B, cellular components, fibroblasts and chondriocytes. Collagen is, is tough and gives the tissue strength and stiffness to resist mechanical force and deformation. Elastin gives spring-like properties to a tissue, enabling it to recover from deformation. So collagen, tough, and gives the tissue strength and stiffness to resist mechanical force and deformation. Elastin gives spring-like properties to a tissue, enabling it to recover from deform de deformation. Both these fibers are intermingled and their ratio varies in different connective tissue structures according to what it is designed to do. For example, tendons and ligaments need to be very strong and resist large forces traveling through them. They therefore have a high collagen content to avoid themselves from snapping over, the, over a twig. Ligaments also need to be flexible and stretch in response to considerable movement around the synovial joints. Therefore, they therefore also contain a high number of elastin fibers. So even though ligaments need to be tough and strong, they have a good mix of both, but a number of high elastins. <clears throat> Protoglycans are water-based, are water-binding proteins which provide spacing and lubrication between the collagen and elastin fibers. This prevents excessive cross-linking and therefore increases the tissue's ability to change shape. As with the ratio of collagen and elastin fibers, there are many variations of the size of these interfiber spaces according to our different needs for stability and mobility. I in tendon ligaments, Fibers predominate with only a small amount of glycoproteins within the network of fibers, i.e. in loose tissues like areola or fat. Fibers are interspersed with large amounts of water and glycoproteins. This allows for easy dispersion of white blood cells. Fibroblasts and chondriocytes are the builders of connective tissue, synthesizing collagen, elastin and the protoglycan ground-based substance. Fibroblasts are found in connective tissues such as ligaments, tendons, fascia and joint capsules. Chondrocytes are found in articular cartilage. These cells have an important repair function in the case of connective tissue injury. They can specialize as needed to synthesize new collagen and elastin fibers and form scar tissue. In summary, connective tissue cells create an amazing variety of tissue structures from a limited number of building materials, collagen, elastin, and protoglycans. Blood supply. It is important to note that there is a great variation in blood supply to differentiate connective tissues. 
Most connective tissues is well vascularized, i.e. containing blood vessels. Tendons and ligaments have poor blood supply. Cartilage is avascular, i.e. does not contain blood vessels. Clinical note. This has a direct impact on how long it takes various structures to heal. Types of connective tissue. We have loose connective tissue. This type of connective tissue contains more cells and fewer fibres and is therefore softer than other connective tissues. Examples include areola. This is a packing tissue which cushions and protects body organs and holds internal organs together in their proper position. Adipose. This is a fat tissue which forms the subcutaneous layers beneath the skin. It is also called the hypodermis or superficial fascia. Dense regular connective tissue. Within dense regular connective tissue, collagen fibers are the predominant element and create a white flexible tissue with great resistance to pulling forces. The main examples are tendons and ligaments. Page eight. Dense irregular connective tissue. Dense irregular connective tissue has the same structural elements as regular connective tissue. However, the bundles of collagen fibers are thicker, interwoven, and arranged irregularly. Fascia is a main example of this. Cartilage. In cartilage, the spaces in between the collagen and elastin fibers are filled with a silicon-like substance called chondroitin sulfate. This makes cartilage tough but flexible. It has qualities intermediate between dense connective tissue and bone. Examples include hyalin cartilage, i.e. the lining, lining the surface of synovial joints. Fibrocartilage, i.e. the intervertebral discs, meniscus in the knee and elastic. Bone. In bone, cells sit in cavities called lucinae, surrounded by circular layers of a very hard matrix containing calcium and mineral salts and gives large amounts of collagen fibers. This replaces the ground substance found in other connective tissue and produces the most rigid yet resilient tissue in our bodies. Blood. Blood or vascular tissue is considered a connective tissue because it consists of blood cells surrounded by a non-living fluid matrix called blood plasma. The fibres of blood are soluble protein molecules that become visible only during blood clotting. Blood is not a typical connective tissue. It is the transport vehicles for the cardiovascular system and carries nutrients and waste materials throughout the body. Come into a little um, little block of stuff. So tissue types, we have tissue types, cell fiber types, insoluble fiber proteins, interfibrial, interfibrial elements, ground substance, water binding proteins. Bone, osteocytes, osteoblasts, osteoclast. Uh, they are a collagen, and they replaced by mineral salts, calcium, calcium carbonate, calcium phosphate. Tissue type, cartilage ligament, cell, chondrocyte, fibroblast. Fiber type is collagen and elastin, collagen and elastin. So both the same there. And then the ground substance, uh, water binding proteins is chondroitin sulfate minimal protoglycates between fibers. Next is tendon. Fibroblast, collagen, minimal protocytes between fibers. Aponeurosis is a fibroblast, has a collagen mat, some phytoclasts, fat is adipose, has collagen, more photo, proto, I'm sorry, proteoglycans, loose areola, fibroblasts, white blood cells, adipose, mast, 
collagen and elastin. Significant protoglycans. Blood, red and white blood cells. Fibrogen and lastly, plasma. There we go. So just turn the pages over now. Cartilage and bone. Overview. Cartilage. There are three main types of cartilage. We have hyalin cartilage. Forms the temporary foundation from which bones develop. Form the articular cartilage of synovial joints. Forms the xiphoid process of the sternum and the costal cartilages. Also found in the larynx and in the supporting rings of the trachea and bronchii. Showing is a fetal skull showing cartilaginous plates. Another image is of the xiphoid process, uh, which is in the centre of the ribs, at the very bottom, so where the ribs open up into the diaphragm. And then we have the costal cartilage, which is the cartilage that binds the lower five ribs together and brings them into the sternum. <clears throat> we also have the hyaline cartilage as well, which is a synovial joint. Page 10. White fibro cartilage. Contains white fibrous tissue and has more elasticity and tensile strength than hyaline. Found as sesamoid cartilage in a few tendons. Forms articular discs in the wrist and clavicle joints. Forms the labrum or rim in the shoulder and hip joints, deepening the sockets. Forms the meniscus in the knee joints forms the intervertebral discs between the vertebral bodies, forms the cartilage plate which joins the pelvis anteriorly at the pubic synthesis. Coming up to the image now, we have the articular disc, so that's the clavicle, lovely in there. We have the glenoid labrum, which is in the shoulder. We've got the astabular labrum, which is in the hip joint, down here, we've got the pubic synthesis in between the hip bones. We have the intervertebral discs within the vertebrae, makes sense. And we have the articular discs within the wrist as well. And lastly, we've got the medial and lateral meniscus in the knee. Page 11. Yellow fibro cartilage. Contains yellow elastic fibres. Found in the external ear, middle ear, and epi epiglottis. Moving on. So we've got types of bones, according to density. Compact bones made up of a collection of haversian systems, or osteons. Each consists of a central haversian canal, containing blood, slash lymph vessels, and nerves. Surrounded by plates of bone, called lalab... Lam lamellaea, the tubular array of lamellaea, gives strength to the bone. Each haversian system is therefore a group of hollow tubes of bone, lamellaea, placed one inside the next. Between these lamellaea are spaces called lacuna that contain lymph and osteocytes, bone cells. The lacuna are linked via hair-like canals called can canliculi, so C A N A L I C U L I, to the lymph vessel in the Haversian canals, enables the osteocytes to obtain nourishment from the lymph. Other canals called peripherating or Volksmann's canals runs at right angles to the long axis of the bone, connecting the blood vessels and nerve supplies within the bone to the periosteum. So we have the lamellaia on the ring right there. Oops. 
So the lamella is there. We've got the osteocyte sitting within. We've got the lunar site, uh, lacuna, connecting the osteocytes together. We've got the canocalli that comes out towards the lamellae, and we've got the haversian canal right in the center. And the bone is made up of like multiple, multiple, multiple rings. We've got periosteum, which sits right on the outside of the bone. We've got the intercital lamellae that, that kind of runs down. We've got the Volksmann canals, which run throughout the bone. So yeah, really, really interesting, actually. Pardon me. We've got the osteocyte sitting within. We've got the lunar site. Uh, Page 12, I believe. Oops. I'm getting there. So, next we have cancerous spongy bone. Uh, spongy bone is composed of small needle like trab, trabeculae, little beams containing irregular arranged lamellae and osteocytes interconnected by cana canaliculi <laughs> cannot get that right c a n a l i c u l i there are no haversian have have systems but lots of open spaces to give spongy bones a honeycomb appearance these spaces are filled with red slash yellow marrow and blood vessels this structure forms a dynamic lattice capable of gradual alteration in response to stresses of weight, posture, and muscle tension. Spongy bone is found in the uh, epicius of long bones and vertebral bodies. Clinical note, it is mainly spongy bones that is affected in bone density conditions such as osteoporosis. You can see an image of the, spon of the spongy bone very top of the long bone and seeing the tubular network of cancellous bones which is like the sponge sponge lattice effect that we see and then blood vessels passing its way through and then marrow filled cavities type of bones according to shape we have irregular bones uh, consisting mainly of spongy bones surrounded by uh, by thin layers of compact bone they have complicated shapes. Examples include skull bone, vertebra, and pelvic bone. Flat bones, composed of a layer of spongy bones, sandwiched between two thin layers of compact bone. Examples include most of the skull bones, the ribs, and the sternum. Short bones, generally cube-shaped, consistent mostly of spongy bones. Examples include carpal bones in the hand, and tarsal bones in the feet. Sesamoid bones are a special type of short bone that are formed and embedded within a tendon. Examples are the patella, kneecap, and pisiform bone in the wrist. Long bones, long bones have a shaft with heads at both ends and consist mostly of compact bone. Examples include Bones of the limbs, i.e. femur, humerus, tibia, fibula, ulna, radius. So, a nice little image of all the bones there as well. So, components of a long bone. The transformation of cartilage within a long bone begins at the centre of, of the shaft. Secondary bones forming centres develop later on across the ends of the bones. From these growth centres, the bone... continues to grow through childhood and adolescence, finally ceasing in the early 20s when growth regions harden. Diaphysis, di, diaphysis, so D-I-A-P-H-Y-S-A-S, shaft of long bone, containing a marrow-filled medullary cavity surrounded by compact bone formed from one or two primary sites of ossification. Epicyus, A-P-I-P-H-Y-S-I-S, 
end of a long bone formed from secondary ossification sites consists mainly of spongy bones. A-E-P-I-P-H-Y-S-E-A-L epithelial line. This is the, rem the, the remnant of the epithelial plate, flat plate of hyaline cartilage seen in the young grown bones. By the end of puberty, long bone growth stops and this plate is completely replaced by bone, leaving just a line behind. Articular cartilage. The only remaining evidence of an adult bone's cartilaginous past is that is it is located where two bones meet within a synovial joint. It contains no blood supply and is smooth and malleable. Movement permits the absorption of synovial fluid, oxygen and nutrient. Clinical note. The degenerative process of osteoarthritis involves breakdown of articular cartilage. Periosteum. A fibrous connective tissue, double-layered membrane, which covers the outer surface of the bone. It is vascular and highly sensitive. The outer layer is made up of dense, irregular connective tissue, whereas the inner layer mostly comprises of bone-forming osteoblasts and bone-destroying osteoclasts. The periosteum is attached to the bone by collagen fibres, called Sharpies fibres, and is an important anchoring point for tendons and ligaments. Clinical note. The periosteum is affected in adolescent conditions such as Osgood's sh Shatler's and Severe's. Over powerful muscle tendon unit pulls the periosteum away from the bone. This process can affect adults in the same way, for example, shin splints. The periosteum can also be affected in tendon conditions such as medial Epi, epicondylitis, golfer's elbow, and lateral epicondylitis, tennis elbow. So medial, lateral. Pretty interesting. Medially cavity. In the cavity of the diocesis shaft and contains red in the young and yellow in adult marrow. Red marrow. Composed of red and white blood cells, typically found in the spongy bones of long bones and flat bones. In adults, red marrow, which creates new red blood cells, occurs only in the head of the femur and the humerus, and the flat bones, sternum, pelvic bones. So we have an image now. So, an image of the long bone. We have the proximal epicyus with, and that's the top of the joint bone. So that has the articular cartilage sitting on the outer side, the epicyle line, which is around, inside the spongy bone, and then the spongy bone itself. We've got the compact bone, which runs along the shaft of the long bone. And then in, in between that is the medulla, medulla, medullary cavity, so the yellow marrow that sits in the middle. The periosteum sits on the outside of the long bone and then we have the epithelial line again on the other side of course so we've got the proximal epithelius which is closer to the body like closer to the head we've got the diocesis which is the section in between the two heads of the bone and we've got the distal epithelius so bone markings projections and bones that form sites for muscle and ligament attachment We've got the trochanter, the very large, blunt-shaped projection. Only examples are the greater and lesser trochanter on the femur. Tuberosity, large, rounded projections. Main examples are the tibial tuberosity and the ischial tuberosities. Tubercle, a small, rounded projection. Examples are the greater and lesser tubercles on the humerus, which provide attachment for the rotator cuff muscles, and crest, a narrow ridge of bone, which is usually prominent. Examples is the iliac crest. <laughs> Epicondyl, a raised area on or above a condyle of a long bone. Examples are the medial and lateral epicondyles on the distal condyles of the humerus, spine. 
a sharp and pointed projection. Examples are the anterior superior iliac spine, so the ASIS, and the posterior superior iliac spine, PSIS. On the ilium, the pelvis, on the vertebrae, they are referred to as the spinous processes. So there's some images here of the hip and like the posterior superior iliac spine, so the PSIS. And we've got the tuberal of the iliac crest, iliac crest, anterior superior iliac crest. It's got the medial border of the scapula, and we've got the lateral border of the scapula. So again, that medial bringing it more to the centre line, that lateral taking it away from that centre centre line. We've got spinal scapula, which runs across uh, the superior uh, the superior part of the scapula. I've got the spinous processes of vertebrae, which is that little nubbin that just sits on the on the centre of your back. That's that little rounded edge. We've got the lesser trochanter, which is, as we know, is on the femur. Uh, we've got the greater trochanter, so it sits above that, of course. Greater, lesser. So that's kind of always the way. It's just what is ever closer and bigger is going to become greater. Got the tibial tuberosity on the tibia. We've got the lateral and medial epicondyle as well. 17. Projections on bone that help to form joints. So we have the head, a round expansion, and one end of a long bone. Example is the head of the fibula, which articulates with the tibia just below the knee joint. Facet. A smooth, nearly flat surface at one end of a bone, which articulates with another bone. Examples are the facet joints of the vertebra. Condyle, a large rounded projection which articulates with another bone. Examples are the elbow and knee joint. Got the facet of the rib image here, and we've got the tibia and fibula. As we know, the tibia is the greater of the two bones and the fibula, so it's feeble fibula, tough tibia. A uh, diagram we have is the head and the medial condyle of the tibia and the lateral condyle of the tibia. I think we're moving through these quite quickly. We're on page 18 of 37. Only a couple thousand more pages to go. So we've got the overview of, skelet of the skeleton structure. We've got the skull, we've got the cranium, facial bones, got the clavicle, got the sternum, got the ribs, got the humerus, uh, we've got the bony and thorax and sternium, so that's there and there, the vertebral column, which is a lovely spine going down itself, we have the vertebrae, which are those sections just moving down the body, we've got the radius and ulna, so as you run this face out and your hand is facing the sky, your radius will be the bone that's going towards your thumb and the ulna is the bone going towards your pinky. We then have the carpals and metacarpals which are your wrist bones and the phalanges. Next we have the pelvic girdle on the hip. We have the femur which is your largest bone running from the hip, jo uh, hip joint, hip socket, all the way down to your your knee, so your synovial joint, and you have the patella, which goes, which sits above that uh, on top of your femur. Then we've got the tibia and fibula, so remember tough tibia, feeble fibula. Then we've got the tarsals, metatarsals, phalanges. So tar, car, so you're pushing the pushing the accelerator. Uh, so sorry, car, metacarpals, you're driving the car. Tar, you're walking on tar. So that's what's right. Us to it back in the day. On the back of the body, we have the pari, parietal, parietal skull and back, occipital bone, lower down, temporal bone on the side, mastoid process, mas, mas, yeah, mastoid process, you got it. Uh, ligament nuchae, which is I think just about on C1, C2. We've got the mandible. Uh, 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 uh. Clavicle, which comes and sits around the back. Next, we've got the acromion, so the scapula. 
uh, so the acromion of the scapula, which is that very slight edge piece that sits around the edge there. We've got the scapula itself, we've got the humerus, so we've got C1 to C7, T1 to T12, L1 to L5, so cervical 1 to cervical 7, thoracic 1 to thoracic 12, lumbar 1 to lumbar 5. We've got the supra suprapineous ligament, we've got the posterior superior iliac spine, so the back posterior, medial sacral crest towards that midline, lateral sacral crest towards that lateral line, and sacral foramina. Next we've got the back of the ulna, back of the radius, iliac crest, olecranian process of the ulna, so that's now the back of the back of the owner, angle of rib, tubercle of the rib as well. Get that eventually. Lovely. So now we're getting to the meat of some of the questions. So this is going to be in relation to question two of the exam. <clears throat> so before we get that, we're going to read a little bit more before we get into the questions. So three, joints, classifications, and overview. Structural classification. One, fibrous joints. In these joints, no joint cavity is present. Sutures where the irregular edges of bone interlock and are bound tightly together by connective tissues. Only examples in the skull. Syndesmosis, a fibrous joint where the Interosis, so I'm going to sp um, spell that one. So S Y N D E S M O S E S uh, into an interosis membrane. So I N T E R R O S E U S membrane. You know, it's the two bones. Examples are between the radius, ulna, and tibia, and fibula. Gomphosis, G O M P H O S E S. A peg in a socket. Only example are in the teeth. Cartilaginous joints. In these joints, no joint cavity is present and the fibro cartilage disc connects the two bones. Main examples are found in the joints in the axial skeleton, i.e. the center line of the body, the pubic symphysis, and the intervertebral joints connected by the discs. Three, synovial joints. These joints have a joint cavity and contain synovial fluid. They are freely movable and have a number of common features. Articular or hyaline cartilage covers the ends of the bones that form the joint. Joint cavity filled with lubricating synovial fluid and enclosed by a double layered sleeve called the capsule. The outer layer of the capsule is called the capsular ligament. It is a tough fibrous connective tissue that is continuous with the periosteum of the connecting bones. The inner layer is called the synovial membrane. It is a smooth membrane made up of loose connective tissue that lines all the internal joint surfaces, synovial fluid. A slippery fluid that occupies the free spaces within the joint capsule and within the articular cartilage. When a joint is compressed by movement, the fluid is forced out of the joint and into the cartilage and intercital space, i.e. lymph. When pressure is relieved, a decrease of interarticular pressure stimulates the influx of fluid back into the joint cavity, Letterman 2005. This is known as the transsynovial pump. Clinical note. During injury to the joint, extra fluids is produced and creates a characteristic swelling of the joint. Techniques which encourage the activation of the transsynovial pump can encourage the drainage of this excess fluid into the articular cartilage. This, the synovial membrane and the surrounding lymphatic vessels. Collateral ligaments. The capsule is reinforced and strengthened by a number of 
collateral ligaments that are distinct from the capsule. Ligaments always bind bone to bone and restrict movements in certain directions, preventing unwanted movement. Clinical note. If someone has loose slash lax ligaments, either con congenitally or from previous injury, this will lead to hypermobility in the joint. Bursae. These are fluid-filled sacs whose function is to help cushion the joint. They are lined by a synovial membrane and contain synovial fluid. Common examples is the subacromial bursa in the glenohumeral joint. It is important to note that bursa are also located outside the synovial joints and often found between tendons and bones or ligaments and bones. A common example is the trochanteric bursa, so T-R-O-C-H-A-N-T-E-R-I-C, bursa, which cushions between the greater trochanter and tendon attachments of the great gluteal muscles. Tendon sheaths. Oh, hello, welcome. Fun to have you here. Just sit back, enjoy yourself and just chill. Um, absolutely no stress. Tendon sheaths. They are frequently found in close proximity to synovial joints. They have the same structure as bursae and wrap themselves around tendons, which are prone to friction in order to protect them. Common examples are the small tendons of the wrist and the hand. Articular discs, menisci. Similar to the fibrocartilage discs found in cartilaginous joints, i.e. Inter- uh, vertebral discs, pubic symphysis found in the knee joint. We're also looking at a little image here as well. Uh, so we have the bone, so this is a synovial joint. It's got the bone which runs down on both sides that come in. We have the ligament that attaches bone to bone, so they only attach bone to bone. They don't attach muscle to bone, just bone to bone. Next we're looking at the joint capsule that runs along that ligament that attaches again to the bone to the bone, and the synovial membrane that goes down and hooks underneath, right onto the hyaline cartilage on both sides. Hyaline cartilage sits around both of the bones, and inside of that is a synovial fluid in the synovial flat, uh, sac. And then we've got the periosteum as well, which runs along the bones as they move their way out. 21, 20. The muscular system. Muscle overview. Muscle is composed of 75% water, 20% protein, and 5% mineral salts. Glycogen and its fat, it is important to note that all muscle cells have an elongated shape and are therefore referred to as muscle fibers. There are three main types of muscle tissue. Smooth, unstrated, unserrated, involuntary muscle. Smooth muscle cells are usually spindle-shaped and arranged in sheets or layers. Smooth muscles are found in viscera, i.e. stomach and small slash large intestine, blood vessels, uterus, i.e. the hollow organs. Its main function are to squeeze substances through organs and tracts and to move the blood in arteries. Smooth muscle is under involuntary control and contraction and contractions are usually gentle and rhythmic with the exceptions such as vomiting and birth control. Cardiatic striated involuntary muscles, cardiatic muscles, cardiatic fibers, muscle fibers are found in the heart only and exist to pump the heart. Structurally They are made up of branching fibres that are striated in appearance and are separated or interspersed by discs, known as intercalating discs. They are under involuntary control. Skeletal slash striated slash voluntary muscles. Skeletal muscles attach to and cover over the bone skeleton. They are under voluntary control. Skeletal muscles fatigue easily, but can be strengthened. They are capable of power, of powerful, rapid, 
constant contractions, as well as longer sustained contractions. Skeletal muscles enable us to perform both feats of strength and controlled finer movements. Hence why you can hold these babies. Uh, B. Skeletal muscle structure. Some main points about skeletal muscle. They make up approximately 40% of total body weight. Their primary function is to produce movement through the ability to contract and relax in a coordinated manner. They are attached to bone by tendons. When muscle contracts, it transmits tension to the bones across one or more joints and movement occurs. The muscle attachment point is, the, is to the relatively stationary points on a bone is called the origin. The attachment point to the bone that moves is called the insertion. Skeletal muscle structure. Below is a cross section of the whole structure of the muscle tendon, tendon unit. So what we see here is we see the muscle coming in on the left side. Then it breaks apart and we see it cut into a strand. So that is called the fasc fasciicel. So F-A-S-C-I-C-L-E. So that runs around one of the muscle groups. <clears throat> surrounding the muscles as well as the epimyceum so this is like the binding on the outside of the muscle then we have the perimyceum which is interspersed within these muscle muscle uh, spindles basically um, next we have endomyceum which goes even further into those into those muscle blocks um, and we've got the nerve axion, axon that runs through those through those, those smaller blocks. We've got the nerve axon branch, which runs into another, so basically imagine like muscle, then it runs even smaller, and then even smaller, and then even smaller, so it goes down four times. And that is going to be a muscle fibre cell. So this is the actual fibre, so it's quite small. So we've got the motor end plate, so the neuromuscular junction, We've got the muscle cell nuclei, which are little, little dots dotted around. We've got a capillary running through there. We've got the transverse tu tubule, which kind of runs kind of around in a circle around all of these muscle fiber cells. And we've got the sarcoplasmic retinaculum that, again, is like the cage that holds this fiber in. That breaks down even further into a sarcomere, into a my myofibril. So it's even tinier. So that comes down again, and we've got a myofilament, and that has an actin and myosin. So these are what causes movements and pull and push within the actual muscles. So it's really, really interesting. 24, that's page. Welcome to the late night, late night show, where we get to enjoy talking about muscles. So the functional unit of a, of a skeletal muscle is known as a muscle fiber, which is elongated and cylindrical and can range from a few millimeters to 30 centimeters in length. A delicate connective tissue called the endomyceum surrounds each individual fiber, separating it from its neighbors, but can also connect them together as well. These fibers are grouped together in bundles covered by the peri perimyceum. These bundles are themselves grouped together and in the whole, uh, these bundles are grouped together and the whole muscle is encased in a sheath called the epimyceum. The endomyceum, perimyceum and epimyceum are the connective tissue components of the muscle unit. They also known as, collectively as myofascial. So myofascia. So these, this is what the fascia, what the myofascial comes into knowing. We have muscle attachments. The myofascia extends beyond the muscle fibers to form a cord of dense regular connective tissue called a tendon, or is a broad flat sheath called an aponeuriosis. Love that word. Both these structures secure muscles to the periosteum of the bone or to the fascia of other muscles. Other types of muscles attachment include raphe, 
a seam of fibrous tissue or flat patch, patch of tendon may form on the body of a muscle where it is exposed to friction, e.g. the deep surface of the trapezius where it rubs against the spine of the scapula. Intermuscular septa. In some cases, flat sheets of dense connective tissue penetrate between muscles, providing another medium to which muscle fibres may attach, e.g. the anterior intermuscular septum in the flexor compartment of the forearm. Muscle attachments. Many muscles have two attachments, one at each end. However, more complex muscles are often attached to several different structures at their origin and or insertion. If these attachments are separated, the muscle is said to have two more heads. For example, the bicep brachii has two heads at its origin and two heads at its insertion. So it's that joining up of origin and insertion. Muscle architecture. Muscle architecture is the arrangement of muscle fibres relative to the axis of force generation. The term used to describe this angle is penetration, and muscles fall into several categories. Penate, so we've got unipenate, fibres lie at a single angle to the force generated axis, e.g. vastus lateralis medialis, medials, bipenate. Fibres lie at two angles to the force generating axis, e.g. rectus femoris. Multipenate. Fibres lie at multiple angles to the force generating axis, e.g. deltoids. We have parallel, so this is number two, so we've got a parallel. Fibres are parallel to the force generating axis, e.g. biceps brachii. Convergent. Fibres from a broad attachment converge to form a narrow attachment, forming a fan-shaped shape, e.g. pectoralis major. Circular. Fibres are arranged in concentric rings, giving the muscles a circular shape. Example, orbicularis oculi, as we all know, is around, around the eye. Clinical note. The direction of the fibres in a particular part of a muscle will often determine the direction and type of work to be done. It is therefore important to know the articular, the architectural characteristics of each muscle. Muscle contraction, the muscle cell contractile components. Within each muscle fibre, the contractual elements that perform the work of the muscle are called myofilaments. These comprise of a thick, myosin filament, a thin actin filament. The myosin filament has molecular heads that extend to sites on the adjacent actin filament and bend to bring about contraction. These actin and myosin filaments lie parallel to each other in an overlapping pattern that produces the characteristic striated appearance of skeletal muscles. Several of these myofilaments form a sarcomere, which is considered to be the unit of contraction in a muscle cell. A string of sarcomeres lined up in sequence from a myofibril, a muscle thread. Each muscle fibre is composed of several myofibrils. Surrounding and penetrating the myofibrils is a system of microtubes called transverse tubules. These tubules carry the chemical trigger calcium, which is necessary for muscle contraction at a molecular level. The most commonly accepted theory for muscle contraction is the cross bridge or sliding filament theory. It attempts to explain how muscle tissue shortens when simulated by a motor neuron. 1. When a nerve impulse excites a neuromuscular junction, i.e. where the nerve meets the muscle, 
calcium is released from the transverse tubules where it is stored into the fluid surrounding the myofilaments. Two, this causes a molecular response in which the heads of the myosin filaments attach themselves to attractor sites on the actin filament and pole. This propels the filaments into a more deeply overlapping and interlocking position, effectively shortening the sarcomere. As all the sarcomeres in many muscle cells shorten, muscle contraction occurs. When nerve stimulation stops, calcium is transported back into the transverse tubules and the myosin heads release. It is important to note that muscles cannot lengthen on their own. The contractile units, i.e. the sarcomeres, must be pulled back to their original position by some external force, i.e. opposing muscle gravity. D. The neuromuscular system. The neuromuscular junction, the point of contact between the nervous system and the muscular system, is the neuromuscular junction. This is where a nerve, which is made up of many neurons, synapse with, i.e. connect with, many different locations on a muscle. Although each single muscle fibre is enervated by only one neuron, each neuron may enervate several muscle cells. It does this by extending an individual branch to each muscle fiber, so each muscle fiber has a single neuromuscular junction. The motor unit. A particular neuron and all of the muscle cells, fibers, that it innervates is known as a motor unit. When a neuron fires, all the unit contract. The average number of muscle fibers in a unit about 150, but this can vary enormously from less than 10 to several hundred. Where fine gradation, gradation of movement are required, as in the small muscles of the finger, the numbers of muscle fibers in each unit is small. On the other hand, where more gross movements are required, such as large muscles of the lower limb, each neuron may supply a motor unit of several hundred fibres. Muscle fibres in a single motor unit are spread throughout the whole muscle, rather than being clustered together. This means that simulation of a single motor unit will cause the entire muscle to exhibit a weak contraction. A skeletal muscle contraction works on an all or nothing principle. In other words, the muscle fibres in a motor unit will either contract or not at all. The strength of contraction is controlled by certain motor units being switched on while others are not switched on at all. This is determined by nerve impulses from the brain. Under normal conditions, motor units tend to work in relays. Some, so some units are resting while others are contracting. In periods where a greater muscular effort is required, most of the muscle of the motor units may be stimulated at the same time. Muscle tone. Muscle tone is the level of tension in a muscle when it is at rest. It describes the slightly contracted state which muscles adopt during the normal resting state. Muscle tone does not produce active movement, but it keeps the muscle firm 
healthy and ready to respond to stimulation. It also helps to maintain our posture. Hypertonic. Muscles have more motor units switched on than is normal and are therefore over contracting in their normal rest. Hypotonic. Muscles have less motor units switched on than is normal and is therefore under contracting in their normal resting state. Clinical note. Muscle tone effectively refers to the amount of neurological input of a muscle receives. And although it can be measured, it is not something that directly assessed by remedial therapists. The therapists have to make subjective judgments on what they consider may be hypertonic, more contracted, or hypotonic, less contracted, in any given muscle in a particular individual. This can usually be identified as muscle shortening in hypertonic muscles and muscle lengthening in hypotonic muscles. Agonists, antagonists. For virtually all skeletal muscle tissue, corresponding muscle tissue pulls in opposite direction. Within muscle pairs, the muscle that is contracting to produce the movement in question is the agonist, and the muscle that opposes this is the antagonist. For example, when someone is flexing their elbow to bring a glass to their mouth, the biceps brachii is providing the force of contraction and is the agonist. The opposing muscle of the triceps is the antagonist. When extending the elbow to put the glass back down, the, tri the triceps become the agonist and the biceps the antagonist. It's that give and take and switch. Types of muscle contraction. In skeletal muscles, there are two main ways in which muscles work slash activate to stabilize our joints and provide movement. Co-contraction, this is where the agonist and antagonist contract simultaneously to control the joint where no movement is taking place. This is also known as isometric contraction. Reciprocal inhibition slash activation, this is where one muscle contracts, i.e is activated and is opposing its opposing muscle relaxes and lengthens i.e. is inhibited in order to produce movement at a joint this is known as an isotonic contraction for example when writing the shoulder and trunk Muscles are co-contracting to stabilize the shoulder girdle and upper arm while the forearm flexes, extenses, are reciprocally inhibited, activated to produce movements of the fingers and wrist. As we shall see, muscle contraction during most daily activities is an extremely complex arrangement of co-contraction and reciprocal inhibition slash activation across numerous muscle groups. Rather than involving one or two pairs, this is orchestrated through motor programming from higher centers, i.e. the brain. Rather than being governed at the local level by spinal reflexes, as was originally thought. Proprioception. For functional control of any activity involving muscle contraction, we need to know 
the position our body is in so we can contract the right muscles in the right way. As with all parts of the nervous system, both motor and sensory nerves, impulses are needed for it to function. The sensory information comes from several different sources, which together make up proprioception. This is essentially what gives us the ability to know where and how our body is moving without needing to, visu to be visually aware of it. The main types of proprioception are the muscle receptors. These are the muscle spindle cells and Golgi tendon organs found in the muscle tendon unit. The joint receptors, pansy, panacea organs in the joint capsule and the ruffian organs in the ligaments are the most common types of receptors that send information to the spinal cord and brain about a joint's position and the different stresses placed on it. The skin receptors provide feedback on stretch and various mechanical forces. Clinical note. Proprioception is a clear concept for the remedial therapist to consider an injury rehabilitation. Proprioceptors are often damaged following injury leading to poor movement patterns and risk of re-injury including proprioception exercises such as balance is therefore an important part of any rehabilitation program. The physiology of muscle and exercise. Types of muscle fibre. Muscles produce forces in different ways. Some are used primarily to maintain posture and are used at low levels for long periods whereas others are used for short, powerful actions when required. Muscles are therefore made up of different types of muscle fibre, which best suit their normal functional requirements. Slow oxidative fibres, slow twitch. These fibres are thinner, and red in colour because they carry large amounts of blood vessels. They produce adenosine triphosphate ATP, which provides the chemical fuel for muscle contraction via aerobic respiration. respiration. They use oxygen to produce energy, which means that they produce large amounts of energy slowly. As a result, fire more slowly but can go on for a long time before they fatigue. Slow twitch fibres are very useful in postural muscles such as the deep abdominal and erectus spinae. They are also used to help athletes run, run long distances and cycle for hours. Fast gly glyoclactite fibres, fast twitch. These fibres are thicker in diameter and lighter in colour with high level glycogen. They don't need such a rich blood supply because they produce ATP via anaerobic respiration. They don't use oxygen to make energy for muscle contraction, which means that they produce small amounts of energy very quickly. As a result, they can fire more quickly than slow twitch fibres, but also fatigue more easily. These are the muscle fibres used in fast explosive activities, such as running for the bus, sprinting for or serving in tennis. Fast oxidative glycogen fibres. They are known as the intermediate fast twitch fibres. Because they can use both aerobic and anaerobic respiration almost equally to create the energy needed for muscle contraction. This means that they are able to perform with even more balance for both speed, power and endurance. 
genetic factors and muscle performance. It is a commonly held opinion that our proportional mix of fibres types has an impact on what sports we are good at and how we respond to training. On average, both men and women have about 50% slow twitch and 50% fast twitch fibres in most of the muscles used for movement. This does vary, however, according to what we are born with. For the majority of people, our genetically determined proportion of fast and slow twitch fibres will influence what sports and activities we are naturally good at. A higher proportion of fast twitch fibres will help people excel at sports which require muscle power, i.e. the ability to generate large forces over a short period of time, such as sprinting, weightlifting, tennis and golf. A higher proportion of slow twitch fibres will help people excel at sports which require muscle strength, i.e. the ability to generate force over prolonged periods of time such as long distance running, swimming, cycling, hill climbing and cross country skiing. Top athletes will also tend to fall into sports that match their genetic makeup. A world-class sprinter will be born with an unusually high proportion of fast twitch fibres. On the other hand, a world-class long-distance runner will be born with a high proportion of slow twitch fibres. Muscle training. Muscle training can have the following effect on muscles. Muscle volume increases, hypertrophy, hypertrophy, the number of subcellular units in which energy conversion takes place increases, storage of fuel for the production of energy increases, blood capillary network increases, muscle and movement patterns. Although muscles are listed individually with separate functions for ease of understanding, rarely do they act in isolation. Instead, they each have a different role to play in complex movements, patterns to produce the functional movements that we use in our lives. There are a number of proposed muscle theories which attempts to categorize muscles according to the roles they play and therefore help us to understand how dysfunctional movement patterns occur. Agonist, antagonist classification. Prime mover or agonist, this is the main muscle that contracts to produce a specified movement. Example, when we flex our elbow, this would be the biceps brachii. The secondary mover. These are the other muscles which assist the prime mover in providing the same movement with less effect. Example, when flexing our elbows, these would include the cora brachialis, the brachialis, and the brachioladialis. I apologize. Agonist. As we've already seen, this muscle opposes the action of the prime mover and must relax to allow movement to occur. Example, when flexing her elbow, this is the triceps brachii, meaning three-headed, three-headed, two, two attachments. Synergist. These muscles prevent any unwanted movements that might occur as the prime mover contracts Example, when flexing our elbow, the tension created by biceps brachii will also supinate the forearm, unless other elbow muscles contract to prevent this. Fixator. These are the synergist muscles which provide unwanted movements at the prime mover's origin thus providing a stable base for movement to occur. Example, when flexing our elbow, the deltoid acts as a fixator to prevent unwanted movement at the shoulder. 
otherwise in biceps brachii, which is a two joint muscle, crosses both shoulder and elbow joints, but also flexes the shoulder, stabilizes and mobilizes. In order to produce the movement, we know that muscles must work in coordinated patterns. Research has shown that muscles have different psychological and neurological characteristics and therefore different roles. In order to understand the roles of different muscles within the movement pattern, this model group's muscles this model group's muscles according to their behavior and structure. This is illustrated by the pyramid below. We have the global mobilizers movement. We have the global stabilizers force production control through motion and we have the local stabilizers which is our joint control. <coughs> local stabilizers local stabilizers provide a firm foundation for movement and provide the most fundamental and the fundamental of joint support research has shown that when we have an impulse to move these muscles become active just before movement occurs in order to provide a stable platform. This is called the feed forward response. When functioning normally, the stabilizers contract in this way regardless of the direction of movement occurring and continue to work at low levels throughout the whole movement. This pattern of steady, continuous muscle contraction is known as tonic activity. The most familiar example of a local stabilizer is the transverse abdominus. Other examples include the vastus medialis oblique in the knee and the rotator cuff muscle in the shoulder. Global stabilizers usually have broad attachments that are situated suited and to controlling joints throughout a movement. Unlike local stabilizers, they do change length and therefore create force. These muscles can be very powerful if working in the right neuromuscular pattern. Common examples of global stabilizers are gluteus maximus and external obliques. Global mobilizers have a high percentage of fast, rich fibers, and their primary function is to produce force. Whereas the local stabilizers activate tonicala, tonically to provide continuous support, these muscles behave physically, P H A S I C A L L Y which describes on-off behavior that is task movement dependent. In order, in other words, they are action muscles that can provide force quickly, but fatigue more easily. Summary. This model is more useful to us to understanding and treating muscle dysfunction because it gives us an insight into broad movement control patterns, which is which can be applied to virtually every activity. Even with this model, there are difficulties with some muscles having dual roles and acting as stabilizer mobilizers under different conditions. Overall, we can summarize. The local stabilizers have short lines of pole and ideally positioned to control joints, i.e. multifidious groups but they produce insufficient force to create and control movement. The global stabilizers have longer lines of pull over, the more, over more than one joint, so are effective for producing and controlling movement, i.e. the superficial erector spinae. 
the global mobilizers have a predominance of fast rich fibers making them ideal to produce force clinical note smooth and effect and efficient movement patterns involve a balance between the local and global system problems are likely to occur if this neuromuscular pattern breaks down this often involves underactivation of the local stabilizer system and a reliance on the large global muscles to control joints as well as producing large forces over a period of time the local system becomes weaker through reciprocal inhibition whereas the global system becomes even more dominant through continued activation this commonly leads to overuse injuries in the muscle tendon unit as well as joint instability problems muscle and fascia the network of fascia this is the idea first explore, explored by Ida Rolf and recently developed by Myers and others that our connective tissue system is a single communication network that invests every tissue surrounds every organ and binds our whole system into shape Els and Meyer 2010 the name given to describe this connective tissue framework is fascia fascia is a latin word meaning band or bandage it is the most extensive form of connective tissue and forms uh, and forms the infrastructure of the body it gives the body its form both inside and out and also provides the scaffolding for the other systems of the body i.e. circulatory, nervous, lymphatic, it has different names depending on where it is found. Around the brain, it is called the, the meningitis. Around the heart, it is called the peri, pericardium. Lining the abdominal cavity, it is called the peri, peritoneum. Covering the whole body just under the skin, it is called the superficial fascia. Enclosing muscle groups it is called the deep fascia. Investing within muscles and separating muscle bodies it is called the myofascia. An important point when exploring this theory that the term fascia incorporates all other connective tissue elements in this way, the terms fascia and connective tissue refer to one and the same thing an arrangement of collagen and elastin fibers which have adapted to meet the physical demands of the body muscles tendons ligaments joint capsules are not separate entities as anatomy textbooks would suggest but are in fact part of the single fascial or connective tissue network muscles can be viewed as contractile pockets along strong fascial bands the muscle's fascia extends to form the tendon and then spreads out to form a capsule and ligaments when it reaches a joint. It becomes the periosteum of the bone. Clinical note. As an example of how this might alter our approach to treating muscles, let's look at the biceps brachii. In traditional textbooks, the biceps is labelled as an elbow flexor supinator and weak flexor of the shoulder b using the idea of the fascial network we can also add that the biceps is an element in the in the deep anterior fascial chain known as the deep front arm line which runs from the third fourth and the fifth rib through pectoralis minor biceps brachii and the outside of the thumb via the thinner the thinner muscles 
We can then therefore consider treating the biceps in relation to poor posture and breathing mechanics as well as in conditions which involve instability of the thumb joint. Biceps bracket considers part of the myofascial con continuity, Jeremy 2006. Tensegrity. The body is designed to distribute strain globally, not to focus it locally. The immediate forces of exertion in gravity, as well as the more slowly moving forces of compensation for injury and patterns of use, are best understood in terms of a particular type of genome, geom, geometry known as tensegrity, Elzemeyer 2010. The normal geometric picture of anatomy is that the skeleton is a comp compression framework like a crane or a stack of blocks that the muscles hang from it like cables. This takes us back to the traditional muscle model where each muscle has a separate and individual action on this framework which need to be added together to analyse movement. A new model has been proposed called tensegrity, which literally means that the integrity of the structure lies in the balance of tension instead of being viewed as a fixed and separate framework. Bones are seen as compression structures that float in a sea of soft tissue tension. Elzemeyer, 2010. This model is seen to resemble human function in two main ways. 1. Internal integrity. Tensegrity structures, like human bodies, hold their shape no matter what their orientation because of the internal balance of compression and tension. Strain distribution. Because the tensional components, i.e. the fascial network of a tensegrity structure, are continuous, any deformation or, or injury will create strain that is distributed evenly throughout the whole structure. This results in smaller amounts of deformation globally rather than larger amounts of deformation locally. Clinical note. The phenomenon of strain distribution is commonly seen in clinic situations. For example, a whiplash injury on the neck to the neck will often cause low back pain as strain is spread throughout the whole spine. It is essential, therefore, to recognise that any musculoskeletal injury quickly becomes patterned into the whole body and therefore requires a whole body assessment and treatment. And that's all we have to cover for chapter one of anatomy, physiology and pathology one. I'm going to be listening back to this uh, to anyone that finds this. I do hope you've enjoyed it. You managed to wing it out for a good hour or so. Um, I hope you enjoy my voice and I'll be recording chapter two tomorrow. So much love, much happiness. <laughs>